Good morning and welcome to another Summer of Drawing. You're here in my studio on Chappaquiddick Island. I'm artist Elizabeth Whelan. This is the first of a series of 19 classes, sort of an intermediate level series of classes uh, covering drawing techniques and also how to follow a concept along um, through multiple different iterations in still life, landscape, and uh, figurative uh, drawings. And <laughs> we'll explore how we use those techniques um, to create different atmospheres. So if you haven't been part of my classes before, uh, you may not know that there is an accompanying uh, PDF that you can download from my website, which is www.elizabethwhelan.com. And on the art classes page, you will find both the images that we work from in these classes and also a follow-up PDF that actually shows all the notes and different uh, pictures and uh, information that I show during the class as well. So those are all available as the classes are uploaded. I hope you find this series to be useful. Um, the goal basically is to get you drawing, to try new techniques, and to get you confident so that you're ready to tackle any subject that you would like. All right, let's get started with class one. Okay, here we are for another summer of drawing. And this is class number one on the theme of home. And the first class will be on houseboat. So I selected the theme of home mostly uh, because it's a rather simple theme. And uh, it could almost be thought of as a boring theme. <laughs> uh, you know, we, our, our ideas of home aren't necessarily um, all that edgy. And so I wanted to explore that concept by, by trying 19 different views of uh, how we could um, possibly interpret the word of home, um, starting with some pretty basic stuff and then moving into telling a more personal story. So for me, a houseboat was a good way to start because I used to live aboard and therefore I know quite a bit about uh, houseboats. And uh, to me, I, I was able to make a home on a boat and I thought you'd have some fun trying this drawing as well. So, you know, when we think of home, one of the reasons it really doesn't seem perhaps all that interesting of a subject is we, we tend to think of this sort of drawing that we've done probably since we could hold a crayon, you know, really basic idea of what an idealized home looks like and done in sort of a kid-like fashion. So what I'm going to try to explore with you is this idea of what does home actually mean? Not settling for the first thing that enters your mind, uh, like a picture like this, and going beyond formulaic responses. But at the same time, you really want to start with what you know, the way you think of home, or your own experiences rather than someone else's. So, you know, home, it can be about the, that place. It can be about the feeling of home, things that remind you of home, uh, a home you miss, a home you're looking forward to, a dream home. It can also be uh, perhaps the more negative, you know, a destroyed home, a home that isn't actually um, a safe or good place, or not even having a home. So you can start to see how uh, the idea that word home can be used in so many ways. What's really important, though, is to try to tell your own story. Uh, it's very easy to slip into trying to tell a universal story um, and perhaps missing the mark. Um, and it, the way to avoid that really is to make sure that the story is your own, at least as you're getting started, and then just taking it deeper and deeper. So we're just going to start off, like I said, with, with this houseboat, because this is to a certain extent, the only story I can um, tell is, is my own, and you're coming along for the ride. So let's see what we're going to do. So here's what we're going to be drawing today. This is the scene we'll be working from. And this is a narrow boat on a canal in England. Um, you know, people used to live aboard these boats all the time. Um, this was a major uh, method of conveyance of everything from coal to lumber up and down the canal system throughout um, all of Great Britain. And the family would live alongside uh, whoever the work person was, um, helping to, to run the boat. Um, and then sometimes, uh, say the husband was running the business, um, when he would pass away, the wife would take over and continue doing the deliveries back and forth um, from the mills and the mines and that sort of thing. Well, of course, over the years, that type of transport uh, was no longer needed, but the boats 
have been reclaimed and, and refurbished. People rent them uh, you know, for holiday cruises, and some people live aboard. So one thing that struck me about this was not just the idea of having um, a home on a boat, but what if I were to draw one, what, what would make it look like a home rather than a boat? And the first thing that came to mind was that you often see people growing plants on, on the houseboats. Now, the houseboats do travel. They move up and down the canal at a very sedate speed. Um, you're not actually allowed to go quickly on them, and they're really not built for speed. So to have a bunch of plants along the top is not an impossible idea. And it could be herbs or, or just ornamentals or whatever. But obviously, you don't have plants on a boat if you're not living there. And I just thought that was really a wonderful way to, to take a subject matter uh, and make sure that the idea of home was brought across. Now, when I decided to approach this for a sketch, I thought about, well, how much do I need to show, for example, say from this photograph, do I need to show a row of houseboats? Do I need to show a whole boat? Or, you know, what part actually says home? Because it's really easy to start just copying an entire photograph. And we really don't need all of this stuff in here. I mean, I kind of like that deck chair because it does sort of speak to some level of permanence. We don't need all the building supplies. I think whoever owns this boat is doing some work on it, judging by the lumber on top and, uh, and the table that's set up. What I really thought showed the idea of home was, was the front. You know, you've got some stuff hanging inside. You've got the door where you can enter. You've got the plants. And then you've got the bow of the boat, which is beautifully um, silhouetted against the dark of the, of the background there. And so I decided, at least for me, that I wanted to concentrate on the front of the boat. And the rest of it wasn't really as important to the story. So now what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes and draw a no tan. Now, I'm sort of leading you along and saying, hey, you know, concentrate on the front of the boat. So just bear with me on this. But I think you understand sort of the rationale. And you may have a completely different idea. And after uh, this class or even during the class, you may just want to follow your own concept. In no way and you have to do exactly what I tell you on this. But what I would like you to do is to just Take a few minutes, uh, as long as you need. You can pause this video for as long as you want to and um, draw a no tan. Now, I try to do it in three to five minutes. You know, this isn't supposed to veer into an actual sketch at this point. But what you do want to consider is the light and dark design. So do squint and have a look and, and sort of see where you see an interesting pattern of light and dark. Um, you're looking for a balanced composition. And this is where the no tan is helpful. By reducing whatever it is you're looking to down into really just the dark and the light patterns, you start to get a good idea of what the composition might be and also what you might need to add or change or alter to, to make it the, uh, you know, to, it's a plan, really. It's a plan for, for what your work is going to be. So what I did was I, you know, I, I decided I wasn't going to show, you know, the um, chair and the table. I was going to simplify a little bit what was going on on top of the boat. We didn't need to put all that lumber up there, for example. Um, not, I, I decided for what we're going to do today that not every um, line need to be, needed to be shown, but I did think there were a couple that might be important. Um, and I also simplified the background a little bit. I wanted a definition of the darkest areas to be kind of an interesting pattern behind the boat. Now, at the same time, um, if you remember from the previous classes, just because we do a no tan that is two color, essentially, your paper color and your pencil. Um, it doesn't mean that your finished drawing will be quite that simplified. The background is probably going to have um, a quite a bit more color to it, so to speak. Um, that area that I show is a large kind of white air blank area is going to be another value. But what I'm looking for in particular right now is where to put those deepest darks so that it creates some interest but still causes the boat to sort of stand out. All right, I'm going to move on to the, to the next slide now. Um, all the way through this video, you can just pause whenever you need to to complete that step. I'm just going to keep moving along um, rather than just stopping the video as we go. Okay, here we are. At the beginning of each class, I'm going to show you what I was able to accomplish in an hour and then 
how I finished up the drawing. And in this case, I took about maybe 20 more minutes to add some darks in. I didn't really change anything. I just bumped up the contrast a little bit. And there's the Note 10. And you can see that I decided in the end to follow the version on the right. There is no right or wrong to this. You know, just do whatever you'd like. Especially for these first classes, we're going to be starting with relatively simple concepts and just trying out different techniques. And the, the goal is to get to the point of something that is a little beyond a rough sketch, uh, has a bit more finish to it as you try out these techniques. So I've got this little video I want to show you before we get started, which is uh, really to do with using your pencils as the tools you need to accomplish the technique we'll be looking at today. You'll see that what I have here are my pencils um, that are sharpened in a kind of an odd way. I've cut the wood back to on the lead quite a bit, and this is so I don't have to keep resharpening them. And then I have actually sanded down the tip to a bevel of about 45 degrees. Now I've got one pencil there that's still uh, in its regular, you know, how we sharpen them normally, because that uh, using a combination of pencils is usually the way to get through this. And what I do is I keep my pencils in a, in a little tray top um, in order from hardness to softness, just so I know how to, to pick, you know, where to find the pencil I want when I go to pick them up. I do the same thing with my paints on the palette. I usually put them in about the same place. So let's watch this video and I'll just show you what I'm up to. So I sort them into, um, the, you know, the, vary, the varying degree of hardnesses. Um, I'm not sure I've got them actually in order here like I need to. But usually what I do is I put the soft ones over to the right and the hard ones over to the left. And it just makes it easier for me to find. A couple of different types of erasers. I like these ones that I can kind of click down and then these kneaded rubber erasers as well. Um, I've got a sketching pencil I sometimes use, which is also beveled to a point of about 45 degrees. Just helps me. Uh, mass in larger areas faster. And I'll use an emery board um, for some of that sharpening um, or, there's, or these fancy little pads as well. But an emery board is really easy to stick into a drawing kit, um, especially if you're going outside to draw. One thing you'll notice when you see this is how much thinner the leads of the harder pencils are um, versus the ones of the thicker of the thicker pencils. So today, I'm going to try to concentrate on using really just three values. One hard pencil, and I'm going to use a 2H for that. Something medium, so that could be an H or a B, or even an HB, although that's starting to get a little soft. Uh, and then a 4 or a 6B for the darkest areas, just to keep it simple. Now, often for um, when I'm drawing, I use uh, far more than that. But And here's the technique I use for sharpening. Notice how I pull the pencil back rather than pushing the knife forward. It'll help you not break the ledge. That's a really good technique for sharpening charcoal pencils as well. So here I'm just sort of showing you what that beveled end looks like. It's pretty small on the uh, 2H, and it's a lot larger on the, um, I think this is a 4 or a 6B. So I'm going to demonstrate here uh, what that, what it looks like when you're using this. So unlike all of the classes I've been telling you about so far, where I've been telling you to hold the pencil near the back and, and using one pencil, uh, change the pressure. Whoops, we got a little bit of blur, but it'll come back in a second. In this case, what we're doing is we're relying on the lead itself to make the value rather than the pressure of the pencil. So you actually want to hold the pencil sort of like you do just for normal writing and put a, a not a lot of pressure, but um, a firm pressure on the point so that you get a consistent deposit of graphite. And the value then gets uh, the change in value occurs because of the change in the hardness of the lead. So here we have, I think this is a B pencil, and you see how much lighter it is than the, the 4 or 6B that we were just using a minute ago. So what, I'm, um, what I suggest doing is really practicing this version of, of sort of massing in uh, the pencil strokes, and then also trying some where you're where, where the lines are a little bit further apart as well. And also some quick lines where they, stop, they uh, start on one side um, and you lift up the pencil so you get these shorter lines. Those are really good for things like, uh, like grass or um, when you're doing a texture on something. 
And so here we have, now this is going to be quite different. This is the 2H, and because of the amount of clay in the pencil, you really get quite a different value. Now I'm keeping that firm pressure. I'm using that bevel, and once again, I'm just trying different strokes. So in terms of, you know, sort of a homework to do this week and actually any time, it's a matter of practicing with your own pencils, seeing what they'll do using this particular technique, uh, trying to keep it to that 45 degree bevel so that you can um, get these sort of washes of graphite down in a really consistent manner, and also trying to do things where you're, uh, where you're not going for the wash, where you're actually trying to separate your lines for a particular reason, because that's a, um, a useful technique as well. And this is the sort of thing that's really uh, helpful. I'm just going to play this little video as well. And all I'm doing here is I've got a, a piece of paper and I'm trying out various different, uh, I'm just getting used to how this feels, trying out various different pencils, seeing what they do, seeing what, you know, how, the, how it's easiest for me to make the marks. And also um, the, another thing that's really useful is trying not only all your pencils, but trying the different types of paper you have as well. I'm working here on the Fabriano Artistico hot press watercolor paper that I, I like to draw on sometimes. It's, it's got a relatively rough surface, so you can see a lot of the white um, kind of coming through on the graphite. Now, if you work on a harder paper, like a regular copier paper, um, you'll get a smoother sort of finish. Here I'm using one of the, of the darker pencils. So learning how to, to hold that pencil um, and, and have a firm pressure is an, is an interesting exercise because it's usually a little bit different from most of the sketching that we do when we just have one or two pencils and we're trying to get the range out of those. Anyway, I hope you end up with a few sheets that look like this. With that information, when we're looking at something like this, uh, you know, okay, we've got all these different colors. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell what what is what value. Like, what's the value of the bright green? You know, what's the value of the red and the blue on the side of, of the boat? It's a little bit hard to tell. Even if we're squinting, well, we can still see, okay, the side of the boat's a little bit darker than the front of the boat. All right. But what pencil do we use for the front of the boat? So you don't always know, right? You don't always know when you start a, a drawing exactly what you're going to end up doing. But there are a few things I want to remind you of. First, you're the artist. You get to make it up. You don't have to copy exactly what you see here. You're not necessarily, you don't have to stress yourself out going, oh my gosh, I need to find just the right value of pencil for the lighter blue. Not at all. Just like we were talking about last summer, you want to start with what you actually do see, what you, what you know. And so we know about dark, so we know about lights, and we know about uh, white, and we know about what's probably close to white. So if we start there, if we start with the lightest values and work our way towards the dark in this case, just because it's a little bit easier to control, we can always put darker pencils over lighter pencils, but it's a little of a nuisance going back the other way. If we start with our hardest pencils and put in the stuff that we think is the lightest first, that'll get us into this drawing pretty easily. Now, in order to do this particular technique, which is not a sketchy technique, uh, we really want to get the proportions of the boat drawn relatively well before we get started. Now, some people really draw every last thing out, and I don't, I don't think we need to do that for today. We're just trying to get done uh, you know, in about an hour, a little bit more on this drawing. So here's how we get started. So for the first step, you just want to use a very light pencil, such as a 2H, an F, an H, or an HB. I've got a kind, of, I think I used an HB here because I wanted it to show up. I'm actually working on white paper, but I've toned everything down in the, in the shot just so that you can see what I'm doing. Because the idea is to keep the lines pretty light. I also try to erase things, uh, you know, I make the changes that I need to as I go along. Now, a couple of things might happen, and they happened to me, <laughs> because I was trying to do this for the class, and so I wasn't paying perhaps as much attention as I normally would. I'm not sure that those uh, windows are actually in the right place. I think they're actually a little bit taller than what I've shown here. But once I figured that out, which was, you know, halfway through the drawing, um, 
I just I just decided to leave it. I mean, what the heck, right? There are windows and there's a doorway. <laughs> and I think people can sort of see that. And I figured it was fine to keep on going. Once again, we don't have to be photographic on this. If you're drawing, you know, strays from what you're seeing in the reference material, don't worry about that. And in particular, when you're looking at the reference material, kind of small like it is here on the screen, it can be difficult to know how to interpret things. Um, for the purpose of this video, obviously, I couldn't have the uh, the image of, of the boat as large or, I mean, a, a, you know, so that it would actually cover up the drawing we were doing. That wouldn't serve our purposes at all. And so you might find it's useful to look at these stages, you know, draw this out as you can, and then try it again with, obviously, with looking at the full size image and, and really be able to assess what's going on. Now, I do find looking at a smaller image is useful when it comes to doing a no-tan, for example, because it gets rid of, rid of a lot of the detail. But when you're trying to draw an actual scene, you often want to see some more of that detail so you can decide what to eliminate and what not to. But this will show you sort of the way that we go. So I find that if I start drawing the focal point, what I think is the most important, in this case for me, the windows and the bow of the boat, if I draw those first, they tend to end up in the right place on my page. If I start drawing, for example, just going from left to right, uh, I could end up with the bow of the boat completely off the page. Sometimes you want to sketch that out really lightly and make sure you've got everything in the position that you want it to end up with um, at the end of the drawing. You, you might want to do that up front. For me, I just went ahead and got started with this beginning bit. So I'm moving along. I'm continuing to draw in the main lines of the boat. Um, I, I look back at my Notan every now and again just to sort of see what, what was it, you know, what, what, what was my plan here? <laughs> now, even though I'm showing you the one um, that has the, the border to it, I ended up uh, drawing it without a border. But, you know, it's still basically the same sort of thing. So I did decide I needed to check those angles uh, pretty well to make sure that I got, you know, for example, the bulkhead in there. And I decided I wanted to uh, sort of fade off, I guess it would be the right word to use, the back of the boat a bit more acutely than I had um, planned in that sketch. I didn't want to show the, the second window at all. I just wanted to keep all the business up front. So I completed all the, the main lines. I figured this is the basic um, of what I needed. Uh, at this point, this picture actually looks a bit more accurate to what the drawing is like. I'm drawing quite lightly on the white paper. You'll also see that, for example, where I put that tire hanging off the side of the boat, um, I left the lines underneath it while I put while I drew the tire itself until I got it in the right place and felt like it would it would work for the scene. There's no need to keep erasing things underneath. Um, one of the beauties of, of not working, um, not pressing too hard at this particular stage is you can easily get rid of your lines. Now, remember, you can pause this at any time during during the uh, the video to do your own drawing. I'm just moving us along uh, so I can share this information with you. Um, in no way would I be drawing it that quickly. <laughs> so step four is really using a hard pencil such as the 2H beveled at the tip to begin shading in areas that need the light tone. Um, and leave some areas white where the highlights exist. Don't forget to press firmly to get that even tone. So as you get started, this first layer is kind of, I kind of view it as exploratory almost, because I, I don't quite know where I need those light tones. Um, I know it's not going to be in the white. I'm going to leave the white of the paper as the white. So what is, what's next dark? This is where I start to try to figure that out. Now, the wonderful thing about pencil is you can erase it. I showed you the couple of erasers that I use um, up front, the kneaded rubber eraser, and also that one that's sort of in pencil form where I can click it down to get more eraser to come at the end, that white eraser. And those are really useful because, you know, you'll, you'll try things out and then go, hmm, I'm, I'm not really quite sure about that. But the good thing about starting with the 2H pencil, uh, to begin with, you're using the beveled edge, so it's pretty quick to put these, um, to, to sort of do these washes of graphite. And the, the darker pencils, um, if, you, if you've used too much of this, uh, when you put the darker pencils in, they go right on top. So it, there's really very little that you can do that's quote unquote wrong. 
Um, I would just suggest for the areas that really are the white or the super highlight, just make sure that you keep the pencil out of those. And I'm showing you here also that I use a piece of paper. Now it can be tracing paper, it can be, um, oh gosh, copier paper, it can be whatever, um, just to keep my hand off the drawing. I usually go work from left to right because I draw with my right hand. Uh, and it just, it just saves you a lot of, um, you know, you might have done this beautiful passage and then you smudge it with your with your hand and you really wouldn't want, you wouldn't be very happy about that at all. So this is a way to prevent that. I'm continuing to work uh, with that pencil and you can see that I've sort of done these graphite washes of 2H pencil. Uh, here and there I've done uh, in the water, um, along the, the rim of the boat, on the flower pots, a little bit in the windows, a little bit on the tire. And also starting to work in some color where it's not going to be really dark in the background, just to sort of see how is that going to look? How, are the, how, am, I, how am I going to blend those edges off? And once again, I'm uh, leaving the, some white areas and I'm also pressing firmly to get an even tone. Next, what I'm calling st step five, I'm using a medium pencil. This is where things get more exciting for me. I'm not really all that, it's hard for me to sit still and draw out you know, the basic lines and do that first version because I, I'm not really feeling the drawing yet. But when I get to this part where I'm finally using the, the medium um, softness of pencil, now it's starting to get fun. So once again, I'm working from left to right. I'm using uh, the piece of tracing paper to stop me from smudging all that stuff I've already done. In this case, I decided to use an HB pencil. Um, you know, you can just, there's no rhyme or, or reason to this. I'm just using three values to start with to keep it simple for showing you how this works. Um, I'm pressing pretty firmly. I'm making sure I'm using that beveled edge so that I'm getting not just the fine point of pencil down, but I'm getting a bevel. Now, if you're watching this and you're just using regularly sharpened pencils, then I just suggest you use the technique that we have up until now, where you hold the pencil further back from the tip and you vary the pressure to give you the same kind of effect. But I'm hoping that you'll try this business of, of beveling the end of your pencil. It's actually a technique that was used for drawing quite a bit. Um, really up until about the 1950s, uh, you know, there were some wonderful books by, um, by a fellow named Rhines and an, another uh, fellow named Guptil. Um, really great books on, on drawing using, in, in the style that was done basically in the 30s and 40s. And this was a really popular technique that was used quite a bit for sketching and drawing. As abstract expressionism and such came along, uh, drawing skills really fell by the wayside. And what was a shame about that, and one of the reasons why I'm doing all of these drawing classes, is that people in general, whether you were planning on being a professional artist or not, we sort of lost that ability to, to learn how to and teach how to draw, to, uh, you know, teach drawing in a way that, that anyone could do it. And so whether you were trying to be, you know, an artist or whether you just enjoyed sketching, uh, whatever your reason, if you're not introduced to these techniques, you never know whether you have the skill or not. And I think a lot of people were, so, were sort of frightened off uh, representational art and, uh, and, and diving in and trying something like this. It's really just a matter of practice and observation, you know, practicing, using the tools, making them work for you, and also observing whatever it happens to be, whether it's a houseboat or whatever, and figuring out how you're going to interpret that basically into black and white, and maybe just like we're doing into just a few values uh, to, to come up with a nice looking drawing. So continuing along, um, you can see how I've uh, used that HB pencil and decided to, you know, uh, fill in a bit more of the background where I, I'm going to have the darks. I'm, I'm not going for super dark. I'm not, I'm not trying to get to the darkest dark. I'm not pressing so hard um, that I won't need the 4B pencil. I'm just still looking for those mid-tones. And I know that there are going to be areas that get darker pencil applied as well. So the, the whole goal with, with learning a technique like this is being so comfortable with it that when you are out sketching, you can actually take your sketches and make them a little bit, uh, you know, a, a bit more like a finished drawing by applying a few of these techniques like this. It gets you away from just relying on the tip of your pencil to do everything, gives you a little bit more 
um, of a way to add texture in, to get a uniform finish. Uh, this is actually pretty, once you get the hang of this, it's actually a pretty fast way to get a lot of color down in a way that would take you quite a long time if you were just doing this only with the tip of your pencil. Now here I'm adding in some texture for the hull of the boat. One of the first things that you notice when you start to observe something like this, you know, first you go, okay, it's got a black hull. So I should color that in with the 4 or the 6B pencil. No, 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 no. <laughs> what I want you to look at is the fact that it's actually not black. It's actually um, various shades of very dark gray with some black, a little bit. And so we kind of want to ease into that. We don't want to start just, you know, mashing everything in black. Just the same goes for the, for the uh, windows as well. We haven't got to the point yet where we need to use the darkest color so or the darkest value. And so I've just decided for the heck of it, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work, but um, I thought I'd uh, change my, the strokes of my pencil for the hull where, you know, where it's a little bit rougher, where you can kind of see some streaking. Um, and I'm separating out the lines as well. I'm not, I'm not massing everything together. We'll see what happens. You know, sometimes you just don't know and you have to give it a try. All right, now step six. Now we're at the part that I love, and I love this part in, uh, in drawing and in painting, and that's when we're starting to put the darkest areas in because now things are starting to pop. It also gives me an opportunity to have a look at some of the, the lighter values I put in earlier and realize that, okay, some of those seemed maybe a little dark at the time. Uh, I wasn't quite sure, but now I absolutely need some more stuff going on. So this is what happens during the course of a drawing. It isn't it isn't always step one through six or whatever. Uh, usually you get started. Um, I, try to, I try to discipline myself to at least get the three values down, you know, a, a light, a medium, and a dark before, before I start like redoing everything or adding a lot of detail in, just so that I can make sure I understand where the detail is supposed to be. Um, otherwise, what will happen is I'm, I, you know, I start working over on the left-hand side and suddenly I've got a ton of detail in that window and that's not where the focus should be at all. The focus should be at, up front. So then what do I do? Um, by doing these washes of value, using the three pencils with a beveled edge, I can get a ton of, of value down, a, a lot of sort of color, what I call color down, without having made all of the decisions about the super details that need to draw my eye. I can, I can wait on that. So here you see that I've added in, um, you know, a bit more dark. I'm, I'm, I darkened up some things that I had done in the medium color pencil because I just thought they needed to be a little bit darker. And then in the background, I've got those large swash, uh, swaths of, of a darker shade that kind of makes the, the foreground pop a little bit more. But you notice I'm also, I've got a gradation going on there. Like I haven't just recolored all of the stuff I did with the HB pencil using the 4B. Um, I, I've kept the darker aspect around the boat where I really want to emphasize what's going on on the boat and with the plants. I'm also using these darker colors to establish the edges of the lighter colors. So I'm kind of being careful as I go around the edge of where the plants are to sort of make a plant-like form using the darker rather than outlining, rather than drawing an outline in any, with, using any pencil, um, beyond those first sort of um, indicative lines that we did in the first step. I'm using the dark to create the edge. And I think that's a really important concept. We don't have to outline everything. We might put those initial guidelines down, but then we use the actual the value, the darker value behind or the lighter value in front to create the edge. And this is also a very important principle in painting. All right, now we're starting to come into the finish here. I've added some more color into the into the hull of the boat, um, you know, working with some of that tonal, that texture I put underneath, trying to figure out, okay, how far do I have to go here? How, how dark does this have to be? And I'm holding back a little bit. Um, I say here to be sparing in your application of the soft darks. What you really don't want to do is just cover up everything you already have done with dark. 
you know, you want to be really judicious about where where exactly does that darker shade need to go. Um, so I'm sort of edging slowly now towards the finish. And I'm also including things like, uh, you know, the shadows that are falling from that line across the bow of the boat and how it actually goes down the side of the boat and then sort of goes across the, the land to see how that works. And also things like, you know, the flower pots, how much darker uh, shade is needed back there, how much of a darker shade is needed on the um, the smokestack. Now, this is, you know, from this point on, you start to use all of your pencils again. You pull out the lighter one and you st you go back into things that need more, more color. Um, you know, you might pull out the eraser and say, hey, I did something a little bit too dark and now I need to back it up. So at this point, you've really got a framework and it's time to, to start fleshing things out. Uh, one of the things I, I saved to the end was trying to figure out what to do with the side of the boat, um, what to do with the the blue and the red bit that is sort of in the shadow. And I couldn't quite figure it out. And I thought I'd just save it to the end and see what I needed to, to do based on what else I did. So I always extol, you don't have to work in a particular order. You know, do what is easy first, do what looks um, obvious first, and everything else will kind of sort itself out in time. Okay, and this is uh, what I'm calling step seven, which is basically as far as I got at the end of an hour. So I, I decided what I wanted to do with the side, which isn't exactly the way it is in, in the photo, but I don't, really, I don't really mind. I just decided to do something that I, I liked. Um, I left white around the edge of the windows and um, the, the 2H sort of color along the edges uh, on the side of the boat where it's red. And I could have I could have changed that completely. I could have left the entire front white, done something different on the side. I could have added decoration in. I could have uh, I could add a name on the front where that that sort of name board is up at the front. Um, you know, this this is what I really want to stress that the the photo reference is great. It's a jumping off point, and you can mess around with things um, from this point on. These are these are drawings. And I'm not even going to say that, hey, this is the only drawing I'm ever going to do of this. I actually, now that I've done this drawing, I can see some things I, I would like to do a little differently maybe next time. Um, maybe include a bit more of the boat. You know, not quite sure I needed to stop right there. Maybe a little bit more of the dark in the background. Uh, perhaps I, I've made this drawing kind of square. Maybe, maybe I'd make it a bit more rectangular. It doesn't really it doesn't really matter in that sense. What I what I have feel that I've accomplished, even in the hour, even though I'm going to probably work on this for a few more minutes, as I'm going to show you, um, I feel like I've, I've got the basics down of what I was after. I wanted a concept of home, this houseboat, uh, the plants, and the idea of, of how kind of crazy that is to have plants on your boat and be able to take them from, from point to point. I really enjoy that. It, it means something to me because I, I particularly um, like I really enjoyed living on a boat. It was a lot of fun, and I'd probably do it again. <laughs> and you may have your own sort of version of, of an unusual home or something like that. Um, who knows? Maybe it's a tree fort or something of the sort. Um, and when you do a drawing like that, you want to emphasize the home. Say you're following the same theme. You want to emphasize the home aspect. So say it was a tree fort. Perhaps you show, oh, a pile of blankets and a book outside it or something like that. You know, something that just says that this is a home and not just a, a structure. And in this case, I wanted to show a home and not just a boat. So I'm going to show you now where I ended up, which is when I added about hmm, 20 more minutes worth of, of drawing time to this. And now I can also finally show it as it is on the white paper. Uh, I Until I got to this darker um, point, it was really um, a bit of a challenge with the camera to show something that was going to actually, which you'd be able to actually see in the video. So what I did at, at this point was really just neaten up a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I, like I said, it was only 20 more minutes, but I just felt things had to be a little bit more crisp. So what I did in order to do that was I didn't do any more work with the, uh, the beveled um, pencils, apart from, um, I think I might have done a tiny bit more shading. But what I did was I took my mechanical pencil, which has the, the very skinny uh, end to it, and I used an HB lead, just sort of the middle range. And I went into things like, for example, um, the areas where the planks on the boat meet up. And I just wanted a little more definition to how those came together. Uh, likewise, you know, where the bow meets the background, I, I just wanted to, to neaten that up just slightly. 
Uh, likewise, adding in some details on the plants, um, you know, uh, darkening up the area where the edges of the, the shadows around the edges of the door uh, exist. Um, I added a little bit more detail to the um, the smokestack, but I didn't want so much that you were instantly pulled back to that, which is really easy to do when you have dark objects in the background. I wanted to keep um, the interest up front. And even though in the photograph, the interiors through the windows um, at the front look pretty dark, and you could really almost think you would just do that in, in one sort of value of dark, I decided to to add a little bit more interest in there to give you the idea that something was going on inside, that it wasn't just, we're not just talking about the bow of the boat here, we're also talking about the interior. And then I also, I looked back at my Notan and I realized that on the Notan, I had shown a bit of the grass, which I had completely ignored until now. And so using one of the beveled pencils, I think it was the HB, I just very loosely um, made some short strokes um, some grouped a few together, others I kind of like did sort of almost a cursive handwriting um, and just sort of indicated how, how a, kind of a grassy look. So grass is one of those interesting things to draw. You don't necessarily want to do individual blades of grass per se, but you still have to, to indicate that there are individual blades of grass. And so I tend to do this. If you, if you can kind of look at this closely, you see, you see sort of groupings of strokes and then some individual bits that look like they're sticking up. And then it just sort of fades off to the side with, with various, with strokes just sort of like, you know, going off into the distance rather than an enormous mass of grass. Because we as humans, have seen enough grass that when we draw, we're, we're drawing shorthand for things that we know. So just as a shorthand writer who is taking dictation or, or listening to dictation, writes down words using just symbols, we're drawing grass as symbols. We don't need to draw every blade of grass. Humans understand what this is, but we need just enough for us, for our brains to understand, oh, that's probably a grassy area over there. And we do the same thing with water, and we do the same thing with, with these plants. I don't have to draw sage plants per se. Now I could, if I was doing something larger, as you know, this is a relatively small drawing. I think it probably was about uh, uh, eight by eight or nine by nine by the time I finished it. Um, if I was going to draw something larger, I would probably want to show, you know, a basil plant from a bay plant or whatever it happened to be. Um, and I might draw more of the grass, but what I would be more likely to do is use more shading, maybe some of that 2H pencil shading masked, and then put down HB pencil, the mid-tone, just like I did right here in only a section. Just because something is larger doesn't mean you have to put more detail all over the place. It's perfectly fine just to have strokes that represent, um, that are sort of symbols of what, of what we know to exist in places like this. Hope that makes some sense. <laughs> all right, let's move on. All right, to wrap up on the concept of home. We've done a relatively simple drawing today where we've learned a little bit about how to use the pencil as, as a tool by beveling the edges uh, to try different techniques. Um, and in this case, I love that particular technique because it gets me so quickly to an end result. Um, but when we explore a particular concept, the first thing I think is most important is that you tell your own story. Of course, you were, you're drawing my story <laughs> this summer. I don't really know how else to do it, but I hope it gives you pause to think about, well, what, you know, have I lived in an unusual place or have I, or would I like to live in an unusual place? And if you would, you know, what, what would that be? Um, because even if you haven't actually experienced it yourself, it's still part of your story to, to draw what you would like or create your own world where something that doesn't even exist, uh, exists because you can put it on paper. It's part of the fun of being an artist. So, you want to brainstorm to get beyond those formulaic responses. I'm pretty sure by now you guys are thinking of all sorts of ideas way beyond that original sketch, you know, that we did in primary school of what a, what a house or a home looked like. So 
you want to work up your drawing from the start with an eye to the concept. And that's where the NOTAN comes in really useful because you're looking at the composition, but you're also having time to think, does this really speak to the concept? Um, should I add something in, perhaps, to make sure that it does speak to the concept that I'm trying to get across? So the drawing te uh, techniques depend on um, using your tools to accomplish your end. That means that, hey, we've got pencils, and we're used to sharpening them in a certain way. We've sharpened them that way throughout our life. But it isn't the only way we can sharpen those pencils. And in this particular case, I really like this idea of putting washes of value down using a beveled end of a pencil and using also your entire uh, pencil range that you have available. I don't know about you, but I was given pencil sets for many, many years and didn't really understand what to do with them. I mean, I could I used the dark, the softer ones for the darks and the lighter ones for the lights, but I wasn't really looking at it almost like painting where I could get lights and darks uh, in such a way to really create this, this more um, three-dimensional form. Once I learned this beveled end technique, all of a sudden, uh, you know, I started to be able to do more. Now, when I draw now, and as you will during the course of the summer, you'll start to mix and match techniques, just like I came in, in at the end with a mechanical pencil to do my tightening up. You're going to find that you'll, you'll put various different techniques together. But it's good to know these things. It gets us away from thinking that we only have to sort of use the tip of the pencil, coloring back and forth, that there is no other way to use these tools. We want the erasers and the pencils to work for us. Those leads can be sharpened in a lot of different ways. Some people even sharpen them to a chisel point to get um, a, a different um, a feel, a different feel with their pencils as well. So try and see what you can do. It's really kind of fun. Um, a value study is quickly done with pencils that have um, beveled and pointed leads. So using a combination of both. And today was really what I would consider to a certain extent to be a value study, where we made sure that we were using different values on purpose to represent different colors or different contrast to get ourselves to an end result. And also you can stop wherever you'd like. You know, if you've been drawing along and you, you know, you tried a bunch of this stuff out, you kind of understand how it goes. Maybe you're not that keen on houseboats and you want to draw something different. Perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. What we're doing this summer is a lot of starts. Um, you can take any of these to a finished drawing, of course, or you can just say, OK, I get what she's trying to tell me. And now I want to try that on the subject matter that I would like to draw. It's more about the starts the problems you encounter, um, the ways that you look at what you did and go, eh, you know, next time when I try that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something a little bit differently. That's how we build up the skill level. Um, we have to be drawing to make that happen. Just watching me or just reading a book isn't enough. You have to actually be doing the drawing. So, you know, I'm going to encourage you to do that. Take time to practice these skills. Even if it's just practicing on a piece of paper, doing those strokes and those washes just to see how they work. And you can always get in touch with me if you have any questions. If there's something, if you're watching these uh, classes live and you think of something, email me and let me know. I might be able to incorporate it in another class. And just in general, I'm really interested to hear how you're doing. As with all of my classes, no one ever has to show me their work or show anyone else their work. You know, if you're working at home on this, um, and I say, you know, do something as homework or whatever, that's just for you. Um, I really feel that artists get more out of learning how to critique their own work than out of having somebody else tell them this or that or the other. Now, if you do want to send me your work, I'm happy to sort of um, I'm look to look at it and maybe suggest the next step for you. I'm not into critiquing. I'm definitely interesting, interested in pushing people forward. Um, but you don't have to. You may have drawn something completely different today, and that's perfectly fine. It's more about understanding how this technique works. Uh, seeing how it can be applied, and then trying something for yourself. All right, happy drawing, good luck, and I'll see you next time.